You could truly spend a lifetime learning all of the features of Lightroom Classic. The program is just so huge. And for a lot of photographers, they will spend so much time trying to figure out the program. In this video, I wanna show you guys 11, I think it's 11, of my favorite tips in Lightroom Classic. These are gonna be things that go beyond the drop the highlights and bring up the shadows of every photo, and they're gonna be more things that are pretty niche and things that you can use on various different photos, but maybe things that you haven't heard of before. My name is Austin James Jackson, professional landscape photographer based in Southern Utah. In today's video, I'm really excited to show you guys 11 of my favorite tips and tricks and whatever you want to call it. We cover all sorts of things in this video from things that you want to do when you're editing to uh, different organization strategies and things like that. Um, I've also got in the little um, description bar here, I've put little timestamps for each tip that I have. So if there's a tip that you want to go back and see again, make sure you just hit that timestamp and you can just fast forward straight to that particular tip. I don't want to wait any longer. I don't like to waste a bunch of time. Let's go ahead and jump in there. I'm in Lightroom Classic right here. I am using uh, the 2024 version of Lightroom Classic. So if you have an older version, make sure that you update it if you want to have access to all the things that I am going to have access to. First tip that we're going to talk about is something that I've talked about in other YouTube videos before, but it is using gradients to edit your image. This photo, as you can see, already looks pretty decent, but we can make it look a lot better by using gradients. So this masking tool over here that was introduced, um, I guess it would be about a year ago now, a year and a half ago, offers us a lot of great options to create local masks on our images. If you don't know how to use local masking, I'll link this video here. You should definitely learn how to use that if you want to create better looking photos. Um, but I'm gonna keep it pretty brief on this video as to what I like to do. And I do this to a lot of different photos to kind of shape the light. First thing I want to do is use a linear gradient. You can notice how maybe this bottom right corner seems like it's darker. I just want to bring that up and make it so that it matches. Nice thing about the gradient is anything that's white, any adjustment that I make is going to be 100% applied to. Anything that's between white and black, so gray in here, is going to be partially applied. Anything that's black will not be applied. Now, as I drag this slider up, you can see how this brightens the bottom just so we can match a little bit better before and after. You can see how we can kind of match the brightness of the top of the image and just make it so it doesn't grab your attention as much with that dark foreground. Next mask I want to make is going to be a radial gradient. It's going to be the same type of thing, but it's going to be a circle. I like to make this as big as possible, feather at 100. Um, and then I like to command minus to zoom out a couple times. That gives me more opportunity um, to move this around in the frame, especially if I wanna make this really big and really feathered. But I'll show you what I wanna do on this image here. I want to add a little bit of warmth and add a little bit of exposure. Maybe not that much warmth and maybe not that much exposure. Maybe I'll feather this a little bit more. And you can play around with this as you see fit, maybe add some whites. Essentially what this does here is it kind of adds a little bit of glow in there. So you can see before and after. We'll toggle both the masks together before and after. We've just added a little bit of directional glow into our image. Um, and I like doing it from the top where the sun is coming from. You could obviously add this glow from any direction, but because in the base image, you can see the lights coming from the top, we wanna make sure to keep that true to make my photo look as realistic as possible. But you can move this around as you see fit to just kind of add some little bleed over into your photo. So. That is uh, radial gradients. So I really like using radial and linear gradients. They're just fantastic in my opinion. Now this next adjustment is another one that I've talked about in previous videos, but it is the tone curve adjustment. Uh, the tone curve just adds contrast to the image, but it does so in a way that is a lot more controllable than just simply adjusting the contrast slider. You can see it crushes those blacks and blows out those highlights when I use that contrast slider. So instead of using the contrast slider, use the tone curve. What you do is create a simple little S curve here. And you'll notice when I create that S curve, it has a similar effect as the contrast slider. But now we can go in and make more adjustments. So I can click in the middle. And if that doesn't work, just hit Command Z. What I usually like to do is grab this bottom left point and just slide this up. This helps so that you don't crush the blacks so much. But you don't wanna go so far that it makes your photo look matte. Um, you still want it to look like a digital photo. So about right there is good. And you can do the opposite with the highlight slider as well. 
And you can keep adjusting this around as much as you want until your photo has the desired look. This is gonna be so much better than the contrast slider because on some photos you might want to darken the shadows much more than you wanna brighten the highlights. Um, and when you use the contrast slider, it increases the highlights as much as it decreases the shadows in equal amounts. So this is gonna work so much better before and after, before and after. It's my favorite way to add contrast to the scene. That is the tone curve. Also, when you're using it, uh, by default, most people are in this, I think it's called like the parametric curve. Yeah, right here, the parametric curve is the first one. Um, this doesn't give you as many options, so always select the, uh, is this the point curve? Or yeah, it's called the point curve. Um, it's the second circle here, the white circle. And then you can freehand adjust as opposed to the tone curve where you're a little bit more tied into um, making certain adjustments. You can only do so much with it. So the, para the point curve is the way to go. Um, I don't mess with any of these settings down here. So just make an S curve, drag up that bottom point, drag down the bottom point to avoid the blacks getting crushed and the whites from getting too hot um, or the highlights rather and that covers the tone curve. Now tips number three and four I'll show you on the same photo here. First one is holding the Alt or Option button as you adjust some of these settings. So I'm holding the Alt Option button on my keyboard and I'm adjusting the highlights or the whites um, and essentially what this does, anything that you can see on the screen as I'm holding that means that it is blown out. So. You can see I can still recover these details here. It's not quite blown out yet, but as I increase the whites, it shows me what's blown out. Now for most photographers, you don't need to use this. You can just dial it in um, as you see fit. But for some people that are worried about having the most tonality in their scene, they can use these tools to make sure that they are just barely not blowing out the highlights or the shadows. Um, I like to just hold this to make sure, you know, I don't want anything to be dark here in the shadows. That means it's totally black, no detail. So I just want to get rid of that a little bit. So again, once you become more experienced, um, this is probably not a tool that you'll use a lot. I don't use this a ton, but a lot of times at my workshops, I will teach people to use this tool to help them to just make their initial adjustments to their photo and avoid having anything that's blown out or totally dark. Now we'll stay on this photo for the next tip. It's perfect for it because you'll notice we have quite a bit of spots in the sky. Um, my lens needed to be cleaned, I didn't clean it. Oh well, you live and you learn, but there's a way that you can fix it here in Lightroom. Um, you can click on this remove tool here. You have a few options in terms of remove, um, heal, or stamp. Personally, I like to use heal when I'm doing this. And what you wanna do, or I guess spoiler alert there, you, yours will probably look like this when you click on the tool. Check the visualize spots and then you can adjust the slider. What this does is it helps you to see spots in the high contrast areas like the sky. So I can zoom in using Command Plus and now I can see all of these spots. I can adjust the size of my brush here and I can just click and remove all of these spots. You can slide this to as you see fit to make it easier to see. Um, you just wanna make it so that you can see those white circles. And that, that's pretty much gonna be what dust spots look like on all of your photos. So you can just go through and remove it. You can uncheck it if you're trying to figure out, you know, like this isn't a dust spot here, it's a cloud. I could uncheck that and see that, but this is a dust spot. And you can really go through here. This is a dust spot I remember seeing. Um, but you can go through here to your heart's desire. You can really do a lot, but that's the best way to fix the spots in your image. Even if you don't think there's spots in the sky of your image, highly recommend opening this up and just checking visualize spots and just taking a look, making sure that there's no spots in your image because that is honestly one of the biggest things in my opinion that just ruins a photo. If you have spots in the sky, it doesn't make that big of a difference, but when someone looks at it, to me, it just screams that someone is just editing their photo too quickly or they don't know how to remove spots or they just don't have a good attention to detail. So make sure that you do that. All right, the next tip here is gonna be a nice way to get a little head start on having vivid colors in your image. A lot of people don't realize, but when they load their image into Lightroom, it loads in as Adobe Color. You can change this if you want by changing the color profile in here. 
Now Adobe Landscape is gonna give you some more vivid and more contrasty colors. You can use vivid will kind of increase the color, some colors and um, decrease other colors it seems like. Standard uh, seems to decrease the contrast, gives you maybe a little bit more dynamic range. Portrait is really similar to standard. Um, so you can select whichever one of these works best for you. You can see there's a big difference between Vivid and Landscape. Landscape, I think, is a good place to be for landscape photography. Imagine that. Um, whatever you do, just make sure you stay consistent. If you uh, apply this to one of your images, start applying it to all of your images so your edits look consistent from the start. It's nice to have like kind of a defined workflow. Um, so these profiles are a really nice way to do that. Now also on this photo, I'll show you the next tip, which is sharpening. So we can scroll down to detail here and we have sharpening options. A lot of people don't understand how to use it. I'm gonna show you how to use it and I'm gonna make it so easy for you. I'm gonna hit Command Plus to zoom in. And when you're sharpening, look at a high contrast edge. Uh, you don't wanna look at like in here because you don't want this to be sharpened. Whereas like right here, you do want that to be sharpened. So most people will just come in and increase the amount and you can see how all that's doing is just adding a bunch of noise and we don't want to do that. We want to just sharpen and not add noise or add as minimal noise as possible. So the way that you're going to do that is pretty simple. Bring the detail to 100, bring the radius to 0 0.5, hold the alt or option button and drag the masking. I'll zoom out as I do this. Now anything that's white is going to be sharpened, anything that's black is not. You can see this is starting to make a good selection of the edges, which is perfect because that's what we want to sharpen is edges, those high contrast edges. Just like that, my masking is at 78. Now when I increase the sharpening, you can see I don't add a bunch of noise down in here. Uh, it does add a little bit of noise around some of these areas. What I generally like to do is decrease this until I no longer have severe noise on the edges before, after, before, after before, after. So the, um, you probably can't see it super well on YouTube. Um, if you're watching it in 4K, you might be able to see it a little bit better, but in 1080, you probably can't tell the difference, but it does make a little bit of a difference here. That's how you use the sharpening. I recommend doing that to all your photos. It's super quick and easy if you know how to use it. Just make sure you use that masking. That's really the key to making sure that you're actually sharpening and not just adding noise. Okay, so the next tip is really for those of you that might be editing on a 13 inch laptop or just any smaller screen in general. If you find that you struggle to adjust the sliders, like you adjust the highlights, but it's hard for you to fine tune it because um, this bar is not very big, a lot of people don't realize you can drag this out. Now, like I said, I'm on a 16 inch laptop. I don't have an issue with that on this big of a screen, but on a smaller screen, it's nice to drag the um, develop bar, this tabs over here out. Now you can see your slider is so much bigger so you can go in and make adjustments that are much finer tuned um, rather than if you had it really small off to the side. So keep that in mind if you feel like you're having a hard time making those fine tune adjustments. Now another tip that I really like um, is creating virtual copies of your photo. So we have our base DNG file here. Let's say that we were done editing or we wanted to apply a different edit and we wanted to create a virtual copy. Like for example, um, I might be thinking that there's not enough contrast and it's too green, but I don't wanna adjust all those settings because I wanna still have the original image to compare back to. Um, no problem, in Lightroom you can go down, click on your image, uh, right click, and then you're gonna go to create virtual copy. This will create a copy of your image that basically doesn't take up any more space on your hard drive because it's creating a virtual copy. Um, so it just lives in Lightroom. It doesn't create another file or anything like that. It's just a virtual copy. Now you can go ahead and adjust this. So if I wanted, if I thought it was too green, maybe I thought it was too cool. I could make these adjustments. I could bring the saturation up. I could increase that contrast like I mentioned. It might be too green now, but it doesn't really matter what this looks like. You kind of get the point. So I, I made some adjustments to the edit. I would probably spend more time usually, but for sake of this video, that's maybe what I would do. Now I'm trying to determine which is better. So of course I can tab to the left and to the right, back and forth to see which one I like better. That's a good way to do it. But if you want them side by side, you can select both. So click on the first image, hold shift, click on the second image. You're gonna hit C to get your comparison view. 
Now you can see the images side by side. You can close down these sidebars here and get it the larger. So now you can a little bit more easily tell which image you might like better. And you can do that with any kind of photo. It doesn't have to be a virtual copy. If I had taken, say, 10 different exposures of this water here and I wanted to see which water I like best, I could hit C to get the comparison view of both of the images. Once you're done, you can go ahead and go back to this grid view to get out of comparison and open your image again. Now this next tip is something that I see a lot of photographers struggle with and it's kind of differentiating. Let's say you have like 400 images from one shoot and you want to make it obvious like these are the three best photos or you wanna make it obvious and say, these are the photos I wanna delete. You can use what's called the flag, or I think it's called the flag system, which allows you to pick or reject images. Now you use P to pick. You can see when I do that, it creates, I'll make this a little bit bigger so it's easier for you to see. But when I do that, it puts a flag. So P puts that white flag on the image, whereas X um, rejects the image, it grays it out. So I could go X. X, 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 I could X all those out and flag this one image. This is a nice way for you to, you know, when you have a lot of photos to be able to differentiate them and see um, if there's like one photo that's better than the rest, but you don't quite want to get rid of the other photos. That leads in really well to the last tip here, which is how to delete photos from Lightroom. There's a thousand different ways that you could potentially do this, um, but the way that I like to do it is by Xing all the photos that I don't want, and then I can delete all the rejected photos at once. So I'm gonna go back. When you delete your photos, make sure if you're in the develop module, you can only delete one at a time. If I select all these and hit delete, it's only gonna delete one at a time. So you wanna go to library. This is after you've put uh, rejected flags on all your photos. Go to library, scroll up to all photographs. Now you can see these are all the photographs in my collection here. And I want to go to photo and I want to go to delete rejected photos. Now I have 463 rejected photos. I haven't deleted these in a while. Um, so you have two options here to remove from Lightroom or delete from disk. If you remove from Lightroom, um, it's just going to take the photos out of Lightroom, but leave them on your hard drive. If you delete them from the disk, it's going to get rid of them from everywhere. They're not going to be anywhere. They're going to be totally gone. Now, I would recommend deleting them from the disk if I were you. If you just remove from Lightroom, you'll get them out of your catalog, but you'll still be uh, clogging up your disk space. I like to get rid of my photos if they're not keepers, if they're just ones I want to delete. You can hit delete from disk. That will remove all of those for you. Quick and easy. Now you can see if I scroll back to this folder, all of those rejected ones are gone. I completely removed them, meaning they're not going to be in this collection. They're not going to be in my catalog. They're completely gone. So that is the way that I go about deleting photos from Lightroom. It's surprising how many photographers don't quite understand the best way to delete photos from their Lightroom and their catalog is just totally a mess because of it. So there you guys have it, my uh, 11 Lightroom tips, quick and easy. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Uh, most of these tips you can apply instantly. There's not a learning curve. They're pretty easy to work in, but they are a lot of things that people don't know about. So hopefully you found and picked up on some stuff that you weren't aware that you could do in Lightroom. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe. It helps me to continue to grow my channel, which means I can produce more videos to help you guys become better photographers. Thank you guys so much. This is Austin James Jackson, and we'll see you guys next time.